My name is Brandon Vieira. Um, I am a professor of psychology at Full Sail University. I'm teaching a class called Psychology of Play, which is largely about uh, having fun and the importance of it in our lives. And for students who are more than anything else going into the game design and game development industries. So I'm actually reading a book right now called Inside the Gaming Mind. I'm almost done with it. Um, and it talks about a lot of these things. So this is good timing. Um, but it's, uh, I think to start with the good, I think games are a great way, especially in the last couple of years for people to stay connected at a distance, um, which obviously when COVID was new, especially that was vital. We needed to stay connected and we needed to stay at a distance. So I think video games, not only did their sales go up and more people start enjoying them, but I think it helped people stay in touch where maybe they would have been more isolated otherwise. Um, and one of the largest increases in mental health concerns already before the pandemic and much more during it is loneliness and the out, the issues that come along with loneliness, everything from uh, lack of building up that intellectual empathy that we were talking about or any kind of empathy um, to feelings of depression, despair, anxiety, um, social phobias, not wanting to, you know, return to that everyday life. I know even for me, like I'm a complete extrovert. I love talking to people and being around people, but going back out when the, we first could go back out, um, about a year ago now, I was like, this is, this is strange. Like I feel weird. And I can only imagine how much more intense that is for people who are highly introverted and then spend the year on their own. And I think that being able to game at a distance was really beneficial in a lot of ways. And, you know, you'll talk about the game and you'll play the game, but I think the game, the gaming part of it sometimes provides the necessary distraction or catalyst from the, from too intensive a contact in the relationship, if that makes sense. So um, the younger people are right now, the less likely they are to be comfortable with a phone call. Um, I think that's relatively standard to say at this point. Um, but speaking on your headset over a game and saying like, hey, you know, this, this thing's going on in my real life. I've, I mean, I've heard lots of people talk about that stuff and just kind of have very real conversations in between games while playing a game, while figuring out what game to play, those kind of things. And then they go and they play a game and they bond in that way as well. So I think it, it can be very beneficial, but it's not in and of itself, it doesn't have to be. So there's definitely some truth to like, some of those connections are not high, as high quality and it really depends on the individuals and how well you know them and how consistent your group that you can play with is. The, the bad is the anonymity of the internet, which is not unique to gaming, um, in that people say terrible things to each other there. Um, and you can be exposed to terrible things that people are saying. And especially if, um, especially for those people who are new to those games or very young, I think it can be especially damaging to see people being so cruel to one another. And that's just bringing out the worst in society in many ways to say, hey, I'm anonymous. All these people will never figure out who I am. So I'm going to say things I would never get away with saying in real life. And I think there's a lot of psychological reasons for that. Um, most notably, a lot of people feel like they don't have the ability to say what they feel in real life and everyday life. So they say the worst things they feel um, as sort of a way to vent at other people in games, um, which is no excuse for the behavior, but it is pitiable. Um, well, hopefully that person trolling you is not someone you know in real life. Um, hopefully it's not your friend that you were, we were just talking about you having that relationship with. So given that if we're assuming it's not that person, then I think the best thing to do generally is to just block them. Most games have great features where you can just make it so you can't see what that person's saying anymore. And that way it has no ability to impact you. Like it's, you've cut off the thing that is bothering you. Um, most of the time saying something back to them, there's a, an old saying, don't feed the troll. Um, most of the time, anything you say is going to get you absolutely nowhere. Um, and uh, maybe even make you feel worse or feel like oh, I have to respond. I owe this person a response and I need to get into it. And that, whether it's a game or social media or anything else for, you know, feeding the trolls usually just makes them talk more and you feel worse. So. That's, that's not something that I, I don't think I can think of an example of a time when it's been a more helpful interaction when people started responding. Maybe there's an example of one that I'm not thinking of, but I don't know what it would be. 
if it's your friend who's giving you a hard time, that's, that's tougher. And I mean, I think that gets into all kinds of interpersonal things of like, well, is that person a good friend? Or are you guys just messing with each other? And it's hard to make that boundary clear. Um, I think it is fair if someone is your friend to be like, Hey, like, I, even if you have to take them aside and say it later, like, Hey, I, I didn't, this, this wasn't fun for me. Like this wasn't funny anymore. And like, I was, it was hurtful, that kind of a thing, um, which can be hard to say, but important in, in real meaningful relationships. That's good. Uh, now, w- either way, your feelings have been hurt. Mm-hmm. Something has happened. You're, you're feeling this way. Maybe you don't recognize it at first, but something, what should I do to be okay? Obviously you said block them, but now what do I do with what's happened to me? Sure. I think it's, there's a really important distinction that it's easy to forget in the heat of the moment that what is said about me almost never has anything to do with me. Like what someone is saying about you, especially over a video game, has so much more to do with what's going on with that person and what's going on with you. And if you're not playing perfectly that game and that person's like, oh, you're, you're, you're a feeder, you died, you're a noob. How did you do this? You're bringing down the team, whatever. Sometimes I can feel bad and be like, oh no, there's some truth to that. I did die, I am bringing down, but like, but it's a game and a game exists to be fun. And it also exists to get, you know, to improve at it if you care to improve at it. And the only way to improve is to learn from your mistakes and make those mistakes in the first place. And that person who's giving you a hard time has also made those mistakes or is making them currently. And it's fine. It's really okay. And once you realize like, oh, this is, you take a step back and go, this is just a game. Even if it's an important part of my life to me right now, it's still just a game. And it is something that I'm having fun with. And working to improve on and if you go well it's not something i'm having fun with then immediately stop playing that game <laughs> but otherwise um it's something you're working on improving on having fun with that kind of a thing and what that person says really just means that that person is probably in a tough spot in their lives and they want to take it out on someone and you are the person they can take it out on most anonymously um and it really doesn't matter who you are the next game they're going to go into that game and they're going to do the same thing to somebody else so it is not worth your time, energy, or emotions to get involved in that. So to be able to take that step back and analyze yourself just enough to realize like, oh, wait, I'm making this about me and it doesn't need to be. This is about this person. This is about whatever's going on in their lives. I can block them and they can continue to say whatever they're going to say. And I won't have to deal with it and they can get it all off their chest. Uh, Very recently, unfortunately, it's come to light that a lot of people will share online their uh, wishes to do harm to other people. Um, and that is always, I think it's something we should always take seriously in that moment and not assume that they're just lying. Um, and I think a lot of times those same people and, and people who wouldn't make those threats will, you know, use language that is directed at a specific group. Um, I think the line that most companies who run games will use is if someone uses language such as, you know, like the, the F word say, you know, like that's a bad word. However, if someone is using words like the N word, that's a bad use that targets, a bad word that targets a specific group. Um, and that word will almost definitely get action taken about it. Whereas the, the F word, you know, however we may all feel about it, may not. It may be something they're like, okay, well, there's a profanity filter built into our game, which is another good thing to have turned on if we're talking about kids playing. Um, So that's gonna block that out and basically protect you from it. But the other word where everyone knows what that word was and that it was directed at a certain group of people and that it's kind of another level, um, then that's something that I personally would always report. Would just say, you know, this is her, they have a little report option in pretty much every game I've played in the last many years. Um, You can say this is harassment and just, you know, say this person, use the word that starts with this letter. And oftentimes that person gets their account suspended or banned or things like that. And hopefully they cannot continue to do that. And maybe someday they'll realize like, hey, this is not something I should be doing. Um, And similarly, if someone is making threats of violence, the least we can do is report it. We don't know who that person is, so it's difficult to do much more, Um, but we can do that. I feel like kids is such a tough conversation because at what point is a kid able to make their own decisions about what games they play? And I think that is a very personal choice for parents. Um, but I mean, I mean, my daughter's five, so she's not, she doesn't even know online games really exist yet. But in the next several years when she does, you know, she knows I like to play games. So we'll, uh, I, it's going to be 
tough to decide when she's able to play which game because even profanity filters don't stop chat altogether. Um, and that's tough. And I think the younger, I mean, not I think the, the younger someone is, the more impressionable their brain is physiologically. It's not done being developed. So what you learn is being incorporated into your brain as your brain develops. And that makes a larger impact, which is one of the reasons things like alcohol are not legal until you're 21 in this country, because it has a larger impact on your brain when you're younger. The other, the other bad or ugly side of, of gaming, I think, is mostly that um, the same thing with everything is that all things in moderation. So as soon as you reach a point where gaming is impacting your life or your relationships in a negative way, um, which can absolutely happen. I think when I first started playing World of Warcraft and I was like, this is the craziest game ever. I'm in a whole other world and I never seen anything like it. Now, like people growing up now are like, oh, there were MMOs forever, but until 2004 or so, there was only EverQuest and it didn't work that well for most of us. So it's, uh, and I, I guess there were a couple others, but they all were not working on my clunker of computers at least. So you, you get that game and you go, wow, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And it's really easy to, to become addicted to it and disappear into it. So I think that's the, the downside of games, especially as game companies have gotten better at making games reward you for playing them more. Um, so I think that side of things is definitely worth mentioning. Um, there's also some argument for very specific types of games that they desensitize you to things like violence. Um, there's not a lot of evidence to support that a game is likely to make you more violent. Um, but there is some, are, some evidence to suggest that a game would dull your response to it or dull your reaction to it to say like, yeah, that's just what happens and move on. Um, or to, you know, like if you're in a, in a battlefield in combat, right? If you've played a lot of video games that are simulating that, you'd be more comfortable in that environment, which in that sense, if, that's your job and that's where you wanna be. Maybe that's a benefit in some unfortunate way, but in everyday life, that's probably not where you wanna be. You know, the, some of the gratuitous gore and definitely the gratuitous nudity that exists in some games, I would, um, I personally don't find any of that to be something that adds benefit to the game. Um, and I would, I guess I would say I would question why, if, if someone is drawn to only those games, what is it about those games that's drawing them to it? And I think the answer to that question might be more important than the game itself. There are certain types of games that tend to be more addictive than others, right? There are some that will really try to draw you into a continuous play kind of a thing where there's no clear time to log off and end it. Um, a lot of the massive multiplayer games like World of Warcraft that I mentioned earlier have a tendency to draw people in like that. And you can make your identity more important to you in that world than in the real world, which I think if that has happened and you're like, well, yeah, my character is more important to me than what I'm doing in real life. That's a sign that maybe your character is too important to you. Um, the, uh, I, I think, you know, we shall, thou shall not worship false idols. And I think that games and avatars and other realities that we can jump into and love can easily become something we turn into an idol without meaning to. Um, and especially when real life is hard, I think, uh, most addiction occurs when we're trying to escape reality. Um, and a lot of things happen that we're, when we're trying to escape reality, such as, you know, that's why we play games and read books and watch Lord of the Rings in the first place for like a quick escape from reality. But when we're trying to have that more permanent escape is when we really run into like, now this is a problem, um, because I'm not facing that reality. I'm not working through it. I'm not being real. I'm not accepting and trying to work through things that are going on. I'm just trying to escape as often as I possibly can. And it's probably making the real life situations worse. Um, the real diagnostic and statistical manual, the, the counselor's guide to diagnosis, um, description of what makes something a problem about 90% of the time is, is it affecting your life or your family's life, the people, your relationships in a negative way? Are you not able to, to work or pass school or do as well in school? or um, you know, hang out with your friends in real life anymore or have as good of a relationship with your family, things like that because of the game. Um, and that can be true for anything. It's not just games because you're playing games, because you're gambling, because you're more interested in uh, doing drugs or in 
Um, even exercising, you know, there's body dysmorphia. You can get so into exercising that it's affecting your relationships in a negative way. So even something we generally think of as good uh, can be bad if not done in moderation. And I think games um, can absolutely hit that point. And I think some of the uh, some of the gambling aspects of games can make them especially dangerous. Everything from you know this has a five percent drop rate, so I'm going to run this same dungeon. Uh, at least 20 times if I'm not a very lucky person who gets that drop early. And the more I run it, the more I'm determined to get it this next time until I'm not actually even having fun, but I really want to get that dopamine hit of that item dropping and I really want to have it. Um, or even in games where you play, uh, you know, quicker games. In between each match, you get a loot box. If those loot boxes are motivating you, it's going to make you want to play a lot of matches. Some games have login rewards to remind you like, hey, play a little bit every day, which keeps that addiction going, doesn't give you a chance to break the cycle if you are someone who's gotten so involved in it that you aren't realizing that it's not good for you anymore. Um, with that said, any of those same games um, in moderation is not in and of itself harmful. It's a matter of the impact it's having on your life and how much you're doing it. I think a good approach, it, it depends on your relationship with that person, of course. Um, but a decent approach can sometimes be like, hey, let's go, you know, let's go do something different. If you know that person, you're like, like, hey, let's let's do this other thing for a while. You know, let's go, let's go play board games. Let's go, uh, let's go out. Let's get away from this. Um, or if you can, if you feel you can say this without the person being, you know, hurt, just expressing your concern for them, or you're like missing them. You're like, hey, like I miss hanging out in this way, like we used to. Or hey, I'm a little worried because I noticed like you're playing a lot of games, and I, I want to make sure that you're okay and i want to make sure that like other stuff is still going okay or if you know you work with you're like hey i noticed you missed work the other day it's like is everything all right like were you and when the person's like yeah my sleep schedule is real messed up and you kind of know like well yeah that's because when we all log off at night from the game you're still on for hours like you know it's, that may open up for some of those conversations organically um and sometimes not starting with the game you know i think asking people are you okay in general, in a way that they understand that you really mean it. Um, and sometimes being a little vulnerable yourself and saying like, hey, you know, I had this thing the other day, I'm not, not feeling so good about it, I'm struggling with time management, that kind of a thing. And being a little vulnerable yourself can open them up to being like, okay, you're being real with me, I can be real with you. So even if your thing is kind of small, the other person is more likely to come back and be like, you know, maybe I'm not okay. And talk to you about what's really going on, which doesn't address the, the addiction, gaming, anything else directly, but it might direct an even more core problem. Um, it might address a more core problem that is causing them to want to escape to that game so much. I think God shows up when people make genuine connections. Um, and to me, I think it's neat that games can kind of provide, like I said earlier, that, that catalyst for people who wouldn't otherwise open up or talk or have someone to vent to or to relate to in a way that they really need if it weren't for their i wouldn't quite say excuse of a game to play but like their their mode of getting together of being on a game together um i have uh like i have friends in seattle who i mean that's the other corner of the country and a couple of them have gone through a pretty hard time lately and they've been able to have people to talk to and especially people who aren't their friends, who don't know them personally, and that has sort of more value to them in a way, because they, uh, because they're, you know, we play games together. So, so they talk to some of our Orlando people <laughs> about some of the things that they don't feel like they can talk to their other friends about. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways, and I think that connecting people is one of those ways. And I think that's that's so valuable. I mean, the. I think the ministry of Jesus was largely Jesus connecting with people in ways that nobody else expected or saw coming. Um, and I think that God can work through anything. So I don't see why video games and any game and any Monica wouldn't be one of those ways. People are often escaping into these game worlds. And in some cases it can be healthy for a while and it can be good to have that escape now and then. But especially as we feel like we need to escape our lives, I think we should look at why, why are we turning to games so much? Why are we, what are we trying to escape? What, 
what doesn't feel authentic or worthwhile or real about our lives? Or is it that we feel like we're not good enough um, or something as deep as that? And I think that, I think we, we, we need God's love. We need the love of Christ in our lives. And I think that turning to games can easily help us to try to forget that without knowing that we ever knew it, if that makes sense. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm articulating it well enough, but that's, I think the same, the longing we have for that connection can easily be directed into gaming, whether we know that longing exists or not.